Hello everyone, it's Infinity Gamer here and welcome to a brief history of the human sphere. If you're new into Infinity, you might be interested as to how some of the armies came to be, why some of them really dislike each other, and the environment that you're playing the game in. So what I thought I'd do is scour a couple of the books that I've managed to get my hands on and concoct a bit of a small history of the human sphere with a bit of a lean towards just Code 1 for now. So focusing on the main history as to how we got into the situation where people are fighting against each other, and also a brief history of the four main factions that kind of exist in Code 1. I will expand this out as we get into N4 so that if you are looking to make the jump from Code 1 to N4 you can learn a bit about some of the other factions that will get rules in N4 but don't currently in Code 1. So how did we get to where we are? The almost accidental discovery of space object GA6037283, the first tangible wormhole, allowed the space agencies to take extra system space exploration seriously. This was the genesis of Project Dawn an international program that saw NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Russian Cosmonautic Agency join in cooperation. The project's first phase consisted of the delivery and recovery of a probe through the wormhole. The probe, called Leperus, returned with data on a new planetary system identified as Delta Pavoni. The first report was the signal to begin the planning and construction of Ariadna, a huge colony ship that would transport the first crew of pioneers through the wormhole to this new system. A double probe, called Lewis and Clark, was sent with the purpose of collecting and analysing an exhaustive amount of data, as much about the system as concerning the terraforming possibilities of the planets composing it. These confirmed the fourth planet was suitable for terraformation and colonisation. This planet was baptised Dawn. The international community was swept up in a great media campaign and the planning of a second ship, the Aurora Dawn, began. To guarantee security and the stability of the wormhole, a third probe was sent, the Pallas, which confirmed the planetary data collected and the reliability of the wormhole portal. As the Pallas reports were analysed, the building and outfitting of the Ariadna was completed. The Pioneer crew was enrolled, from the most part selected from Europe, North America and the Russian Federation. As a joint project of the American, European and Russian space agencies, very few members from other nations were included. The expedition had a marked techno-military slant, with all analysis predicting difficult conditions for the pioneers. In addition to the flight crew of the craft and the scientific team, two military contingents were organised, one American and the other European, composed of Anglo-French units. The Russian Federation contributed a Cossack regiment plus their families, with the idea of establishing a traditional Cossack colony combining military, agricultural and industrial expertise. That regiment would be responsible for the surveillance of frontiers and ensuring that law was respected between the colonisers. In order to fill the ship with the planet's first colonists, European, Russian and American citizens were invited to sign on, with both individuals and whole families accepted, provided they had demonstrable skills as technicians or qualified workers. Besides enrolling crew and settlers, donations of tissue, ovum and sperm samples were taken from civilians and institutions to safeguard the variety and genetic viability of the expedition. The trip was planned in such a way that the passengers would remain cryogenically frozen until well past the wormhole portal. The craft was controlled by a rotating flight crew, assisted by automatic systems. After arriving in Dawn's orbit, they would install orbital infrastructures and then prepare for landing. Once this phase was completed, the military team would be defrosted in order to create defensive positions, establish the first settlement and explore the area. After completing the second phase, the settlers would then be progressively defrosted in order to build the first settlement. The first task of the crew after arriving at Delta Pavoni was fixing a stable orbit around the planet and then proceeding to install the necessary orbital structures for the colonisation. At the same time, a web of scientific military satellites was established in order to survey the majority of the planet. From orbit, planetary cartographers started working, baptising the different continents and larger islands with imaginary names extracted from Western and Universal literature. The second phase consisted of delivering landing shuttles with the necessary military personnel to secure the landing area and making the first surveillance of the terrain. The landing zone chosen, in the Northern Hemisphere, was sufficiently distant from the Tropic to guarantee a soft climate. Placed near the Mirror Sea, watered by two rivers, and protected by mountain ranges with no volcanic activity to north and east, it seemed the ideal position to start colonisation. Landing, in general terms, was a success, and the zone was safeguarded with no casualties. Work began to erect the initial structures to receive the Ariadna. In the first explorations, the existence of several exploitable veins of ore at the north and south of the settlement were confirmed. 
Defrosting of the civilian personnel required for the final landing was performed with a reasonably low number of losses due to technical failure at only 1.5%. Due to the success of this initial landing and upon its completion, the Aurora left Earth. This second colony ship had a greater capacity, transporting more settlers, supplies, and support material for Ariadna. After several months of preparation, the final landing of the mothership Ariadna took place. It functioned as a temporary bivouac for the settlers and would never again cross space. Around it, installations were built as modules for living, research, and support. This zone was afterwards known as Meta, or Mother. As Mater was being built, the Pioneer crew was defrosted to aid in the construction. The failure rate of the defrosting process was reduced to 0.75, and the settler's morale was quite high. Military units started long-distance reconnaissance patrols to widen the safe area in Ariadna. Settlers began exploiting nearby raw material resources. The settling phase entered a dynamic expansion. Once the first settling phase was completed successfully, and the settlers defrosted and organized in a productive social system, a series of military campaigns of advanced exploration and expansion began. However, the inhabitants of Dawn were becoming unsettled, the Aurora had been delayed, and the settlers' morale was falling steadily. Back on Earth, terrible news befell those eagerly watching the Wormhole Portal project. Communication with the Aurora had stopped, and the Aurora would never arrive at her destination. The Wormhole had collapsed during her travel, losing the Aurora and isolating the Dawn system as far as those on Earth were concerned, both Ariadna and Aurora, and all the occupants within, had been lost forever. Back on Earth, the loss of the Aurora and the Ariadna was keenly felt. Not just the human cost, but also the financial and economic impact from those nations that had backed the project, hinging so much on life in a distant star system. These economies struggled, their political structures faltering, and a new world order was ready to take shape. During the second half of the 21st century, the progressive fall of North America as the dominant power on Earth provided opportunities to other countries eager to take the baton from her. The failure of the North American economy was the unavoidable long-term consequence of a single nation attempting to provide world leadership, its efforts consuming too many resources and too much time from the power base of the country. The failure of North America proved the effectiveness of the model used by the states comprising the reformed European Union. However, the EU was too busy solving the technical problems and internal adjustments caused by various eastern states, and was not ready to hold the dominant global position. The alternative would come from the last place the average international citizen would expect. In the middle of the 21st century, the Australian and New Zealand authorities felt compelled to join with their former Indonesian and Malaysian commercial rivals to avoid the unstoppable advance of Chinese corporations and their economic might. The success of this partnership created a new economic sphere that would soon compete with decadent North America on an equal footing. The Philippines joined this new economic sphere shortly thereafter, contributing an expanded labor market and a strategic position to compete with the major Chinese ports. Industrial strength was contributed by India's entrance to the group, the subcontinent working to harmonize the inequalities between her various regions to provide the most efficient national industrial base. This would be the organizational nucleus of Pan-Oceania, the progressive economic crisis in North America had the direct consequences political analysts had foreseen. Internal problems caused a gradual loosening of the pressure and economic control wielded over South American countries. This gave them the opportunity to grow economically and to reach a first world status appropriate for such rich nations. Nevertheless, complex internal South American politics saw that only two countries reached that level, Brazil and Chile. Their incorporation into Pan-Oceania was the last great step to its transformation into a dominant economic world power pushing out North America, who was abandoned by its European allies for alliances with Pan-Oceania. As a hybrid culture, Pan-Oceania offers several features recognisable as belonging to the diverse cultures that compose it. With pragmatism as a guiding principle, an open and flexible society was born. A cultural integration policy followed its constitution, a measure that would result in a mixed civilization that worked in harmony. These efforts saw great success, Pan-Oceanians becoming extremely proud of themselves and their nationality. This cultural pride, in conjunction with economic success, has sometimes resulted in arrogance when dealing with other states. Pan-Oceania was the force that drove the ambitious project Toth, the origin of Aleph, the first and only artificial intelligence of the human sphere. Persuaded of the convenience of an AI in all aspects of society, the Pan-Oceanian leaders gradually gave it a greater number of responsibilities and powers until it reached a point where Aleph was omnipresent. Pan-Oceania has invested a great deal of their scientific and economic capital in the development of the space race and the investigation of wormholes. The Pan-Oceanians were the first to reach the stars, and made use of this advantage to colonize the first inhabitable planets, ensuring it is the power of the greatest number of planetary systems and colonies. 
But for every yin, there must be a yang. And for Pan Oceania, it is Yu Jing. Constantly vying to be the most powerful faction in the human sphere, Yu Jing is a force to be reckoned with. The popular People's Republic of China, the Sleeping Asian Dragon, woke up later than the rest of the world had anticipated. In the first half of the 21st century, Chinese leaders saw a clear danger in their future. China was in danger of dying from success. Socialist capitalism, an economic bastard that only the Chinese could carry out successfully, proved to be more than effective, expanding the Chinese industrial and economic base through controlled development of foreign influence and investment in the country. As this model and economic success spread across China, the faith of the Chinese people in Maoist ideology faded away, outshone by the promises of the materialistic Western world. The integrity of what was once the Middle Kingdom was once again threatened by foreign invasion, this time as an insidious cultural assault. The thriving Western leisure and entertainment industry took root in the countryside, the great ideological heartland of China. Economic achievements saw a formerly impoverished rural population become a mighty army of potential consumers. In order to overcome this crisis, they believed China had no choice but to reinvent itself, following the ancient Chinese political strategy of changing in order to preserve the status quo. Maoist ideals, already damaged by the original Cultural Revolution, were little by little eroded through generations that grew up with no dogma. No emperor, no gods, no Maoism, no Taoism, no Buddhism. Nothing that had defined Chinese identity since the beginning of history. China's leaders launched a new Cultural Revolution, but inverse to the last one, to control this situation. The traditional Chinese values were restored, but sifting them through the party's doctrine. Historic religions were re-established by law, under tutelage of the state. The party was the champion of this change, but needed a distinctive figure that would concentrate the admiration of people, symbolizing and representing them. The dragon, the emperor. In an unexpected maneuver, descendants of the ancient Chinese dynasties were located, and from their lineage, the figure of the emperor was restored as a symbol, not only of China, but also of a new nation. Renamed as Yu Jing, literally Jade Capital, this great power would face the world by merging modern and ancient Chinese history. In this way, the rulers of Yu Jing have been following the same goals as the first Chinese emperor. Conquest, unity, and uniformity. The vision of a great China remained the same. Everything under the sky. The unstoppable growth of China was the main cause behind the name change. Economic expansion over satellite countries was the prelude to the political annexation. North Korea, Mongolia, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Taiwan, Nepal, and Bhutan all joined the new Chinese nation, keeping their cultural quirks but assimilating as new Chinese prefectures. The fall of the former USA battered all the countries that had invested their economic future in North America. Japan and South Korea, with an unstable economy, could not stand the loss of the enormous North American market, while the market of a Europe in recession could not provide them with enough support. With an economic and social crisis on the horizon, the leaders of both nations decided to mortgage their future to that of China. This decision was not very well received in several sectors of the societies of both countries, especially in Japan, whose national pride was severely damaged. In order to calm the tempers of all those who were not pleased with becoming Chinese and to quiet accusations of cultural as well as political imperialism, China resolved to create a new name for its new and immense country. In this way, China became Yuzhing, a nation that, not content with possessing half of the Asiatic continent, would set the stars as its next conquest. In principle, the rulers of Yuzhing did not trust the possibilities of space exploration, as they were convinced that it was the whim of their pan oceania rivals and that it would be their ruin. Yujing's economists, cautious as they were, considered investment in deep space as a bottomless pit where state budgets would fall, as well as a means of political destabilization. For this reason, when the discovery of Neo Terra revealed the real potential of jump gates, Yujing was several years behind in space investigation and development in comparison with Pan Oceania. To compensate, research funds were redistributed and whole universities were reshaped for the support of powerful industries. Yu Jing would not be slow to provide the logistic support and scientists needed. If there is one thing that defines Yu Jing politics and society, it is the balance between power and influence. All religious, politic, social or economic power has one or many rivals that compete directly with it and try to impose their will on it. This state of careful balance between opposites comes from the historical Eastern mentality and the teachings of Taoism. Even though the state empire is non-denominational, there are three main representative religions which provide for the morale and faith of Yu Jing citizens. These three religions preach quite different social and ethical aspects. Taoism has a strong individualistic character and is the chief religion among the populist classes. Confucianism is the official religion of the imperial system and preaches the citizens' obedience to a wise and benevolent power. 
Buddhism has deep social concerns and is the most popular religion in the party and amongst the intellectual and cultural elite of Yujing. Power in the state empire is divided between the party and the emperor. The party rules Yujing and the emperor is beholden to it. Nevertheless, the emperor has total autonomy in the control of judiciary power, which is the area of power that has been assigned to him. Imperial power is divided into two dynasties following the historical Chinese dynasties. When one of the dynasties rules, the other schemes against it, trying to impair its work and give it a bad name in order to obtain more prestige by comparison. Both possess public and secret organizations providing funding and support. Now, as this history focuses a lot on the environment of the Code 1 system, there is currently only really Pan Oceania, Yujing, O12, and the Combined Army to talk about. Now, with O12, I do have a little bit more of an extensive background in history in my O12 faction focus, so I'll pop a link to that up at the top of the screen. Now, with the Combined Army, I do have a faction focus for that, but the history is slightly on the lighter side, so I will jump to that now. And focusing on the Shazvasti Continuum, because in Code 1, that is very much the predominant faction, and so that is the history I'll focus on. When you go into N4, the Combined Army history will expand out beyond Shazvasti. So the Shazvasti Continuum. The antiquity of the Shazvasti is also apparently greater than that of the human race. According to what has been discovered, they are not a very large race, a meager conjoining of refugees and colonies from Messier 82, a faraway galaxy in the Virgo constellation. It seems that their galaxy exploded, killing 10,000 million stars that were in its proximity and 80% of the Shazvasti civilization. A population that originally counted several hundred thousand million inhabitants was reduced to 600 million in an instant. The reconstruction of their culture delayed them for many centuries. Communications between surviving colonies was hampered by the lack of spaceflight capacity. Rescue of inhabitants from outer settlements, dependent on supplies from nearby colonies or from the homeworld, was not as fast as expected and many did not survive. A harsh catastrophe that nevertheless did not finish off this stubborn race. The Shazvasti had to face the crisis with determination. Gradually, and thanks to the production of a rapid and powerful fleet, they managed to reconstruct their civilization settlements. Owing to, or in spite of, their obsessive racial paranoia, the Shazvasti is an explorer species. One could say that curiosity and a hunger for adventure is just part of their nature. However, it is always tempered with the coldness of those who have already lost everything once. The Shazvasti are famous for the ease with which they adapt to any environment. They are able to resist the hardest conditions and mimetize with their environment to increase their possibilities of survival. Conscious that these qualities were the ones that saved them as a race, they have developed them to their maximum extent. Their adaptability is the reason why they are part of the combined army. Exploration, forward surveillance, incursion, espionage and assassination are the military specialities to which the Shazvasti have no rival. The main preoccupation of the Shazvasti race is survival. A great catastrophe in their past marked and altered them physically and psychologically. Shazvasti scientists have devoted all of their efforts to create gene therapies that will subtly modify the genome of their race to give it the maximum capacity of adaptation to any environment or situation. Currently, they are great creatures with very efficient bodies, able to spend brief periods of time in toxic environments without suffering great physiological damage until their body finally finds a way to adapt itself to them. This does not always work, but when it does, a biopsy sample is sent to the lab so that with a simple gene treatment, any Shazvasti can inhabit that given zone. Shazvasti physiology is astonishing. One of their quirks is being hermaphroditic. It seems that after reaching the middle stage in their growth, possibly their equivalent to the end of adolescence, they decide which will be their dominant gender, initiating the hormonal changes required to change. The definition period, or divis in their language, is variable according to the subject, but in general will last up to two months. Once finished, this is irreversible. Nevertheless, in the Shazvasti body, the glands and gonads of the other gender will be present, although not completely developed. This means that, for example, Shazvasti females possess high testosterone levels, which, added to their feminine metabolism, makes them stronger and more resistant. This is a very useful resource for this adventurous race. In the case of the male Shazvasti, the presence of feminine glands and gonads gives them a greater physical and psychological flexibility. It also allows the males to carry spawn embryos and lay them where the continuum wants to expand or colonize. The Continuum engages in expansive space dispersion. Their space fleet is impressive, probably one of the best, with rapid and undetectable Shoni, tactical incursion vehicles. It is, however, too dispersed to organize massive offensives. Nevertheless, the attitude of the Continuum is not completely expansionist or conquering. Great concentration of Shazvasti population in a few systems is not their goal. The great plan of the Continuum is to place small Shazvasti colonies in all inhabitable systems. 
The central core of this idea is to avoid another demographic catastrophe. The Shazvasti race almost disappeared from the star map for having the nucleus of their civilization and culture placed in a few systems, which were wiped out by the explosion of another galaxy. To avoid this, each colony will have to be self-sufficient and store all the data concerning their culture in a wide data library and a varied deposit of spawn embryos as a genetic variety reserve. In this way, a single colony can regenerate the whole race in case the rest disappear. It is probably that the origin of the Alliance of the Continuum of the EI would be a natural expression of the Shazvasti thought. The possibilities of survival and the development of the Shazvasti race with the EI on their side are exponentially superior to what would result if they decided to face the EI. It is widely known that the Continuum is participating in the Transcendence Project with the Ur Rationalists, trying to create its own artificial intelligence so involved as to achieve total comprehension. Nevertheless, it is likely that its development will be very slow, as the Shazvasti have never been interested in the perfection of anything superior to simple artificial intelligence, oriented towards systems management. For that reason, they believe the main interest the EI has in their race may be their adaptability, their capacity to obtain information, and their facility to infiltrate other cultures. It is very possible that the Continuum has turned into the spear point, not only of the combined army, but also of the very EI itself. So then we fast forward to when Code 1 is set. It is 180 years into the future. The star systems colonized by humanity, collectively called the Human Sphere, have been claimed by massive interstellar nations who trade covert blows and secret wars to control the delicate balance of power. But an alien threat from the great beyond threatens to change everything. The main human nations, Pan-Oceania, the ultramodern hyperpower, and Yu Jing, its advanced competitor, born of Asia. Led by O12, the international organization that replaced the UN, must join forces to fight the outsider menace of the combined army and its master, the EI, an alien artificial intelligence that plans to integrate the human sphere into its immense, all devouring galactic empire. Will they be able to put their differences aside, or will their infighting be the undoing at the hands of the alien invaders? So with the human sphere, there are a whole bunch of planets that are occupied by each of these factions. Pan-Oceania has the most amount of planets. Yu Jing then has a lot as well. Obviously, it's the second most powerful faction in the human sphere. O12 does have at least one of its own planets, which is Concilium, which is kind of the home of O12, which is the new United Nations. And then a whole bunch of other factions that don't feature in Code 1 also have their own planets. So obviously we'll expand that as they come available in N4. For trade, commercialism and politics to prosper, there is a network of things called circulars. So in the human sphere, goods, people, they travel through wormholes on enormous commercial ships run by the international community. These are known as circulars. And you jump from one star system to another. Circulars are controlled by O12, which is the international organization that is the second generation United Nations, but with much greater capacity for decision making and taking action. There's a, a single massively powerful artificial intelligence that is present in the entire human sphere called Aleph. It's also indispensable to the great powers and assists O12 in maintaining a fragile balance between them. There are also a couple of other things to understand about the human sphere that are just random pieces of information pretty much. Uh, so we've obviously spoken about Aleph, that's the artificial intelligence of humanity, responsible for the management of the large information infrastructure systems. Um, Aleph is the fruit of the most advanced quantronics, or electronics in a quantum state, and is a fundamental instrument for the advance and development of the human sphere. Uh, O12's, as I mentioned, also in charge of the circulars, which are monstrous cargo ships capable of jumping wormholes and connect to the star systems. Uh, the circulars follow fixed inter-system routes, collecting other ships, cargoes and passengers, maintaining the flow of commerce throughout the human sphere. The data network of the sphere, cyberspace, the virtual space by which information travels and is stored, is known as Maya. Home and feud of LF yeah, through Maya, you can navigate looking for information and entertainment. The leisure industry is centralised in the Maya network, where you can enjoy cinema, music, sport and arts, and any type of amusement and entertainment. At the moment, the most fashionable extreme contact sport is Aristea. This is a circuit of high-level duels and armed um, combats. Now, for those of you that don't know, Aristeo is also available as a separate game from Corpus Belli, which is great fun. I'll link above to a review of that, and there's also a game report that follows. The most advanced medicine allows whims like Aristea, but also the lengthening of life and combined with the best and costliest technology, practically guarantees corporal immortality. The cube, very common in the sphere, is a sophisticated brain implant of wetware a quantronic biotechnological microprocessor where you can record the memories and personality of its carrier. Once dead, and thanks to the synthesis of silk, a powerful drug developed by hackers Lamist chemists, the cube can be implanted in an L-host. 
a clonically adapted biosynthetic body. The process that allows resuscitation of those stored in cubes is very expensive due to the high price of silk, which is an exclusive monopoly of Hak Islam. Moreover, the institutions that regulate the resurrections, religious organizations in Pan Oceania, or the party in Eugene, for example, issue few licenses, exclusively for those who demonstrate their personal worth as members of the society. The advanced combination of biogenetic technology and experimental cubes, together with the great computational capacity of Aleph, has permitted the development of the denominated recreations. Sophisticated L hosts who carry faithful simulations of the personalities of important historical figures. These recreations, with talents adapted to present times, work as diplomats, soldiers, communicators or artists, loaned by LF to those who ask for and finance their creation. If you are looking to play Pan Oceania, you may notice someone called Joan of Arc appear on the list. That is an example of a recreation. So anyway, as I said, this is merely a brief history or more of an introduction into the human sphere. It's a truncated overview of a very complex and rich world. Another place to go to if you want more information is the website The Human Sphere and then also Infinity The Universe, which is obviously very Code 1 focused and Corpus Belli are likely to update that with information as it becomes relevant to the Code 1 and N4 world. So to catch up with where we are at present, simply download the rules for Code 1 and read the introductions that Corpus Belli have written. That gives you an overview as to where each of the main hyperpowers and factions are right now. Now, there is a huge wealth of lore behind Pano, Yu Jing, the Combined Army, most of the established factions. If you want to dive even deeper into the lore of any particular faction, there are probably older books that you can try and get a hold of. Quite a lot of the reading that I've been doing has been from the 2008 second edition revised rule book for, I believe it's N3. It is definitely one of the older books, but it is great because it's also setting most of the history and obviously it's trying to establish the world, um, having been released not too long after Infinity was founded as a game. Um, I've got a couple of the later ones as well, which I'm going to enjoy reading. And then obviously Corpus Belli are pretty good at releasing new content every so often. So there's a manga novel that's out already called Outrage. And then there is a new one that has either arrived or will be coming, depending on when you're listening to this, called Betrayal, which focuses on one of the combined army's operatives, Kodali, and the backstory there. Now, I did say that this was just a brief history of the human sphere to try and give people an overview of where we're at. So you may be wondering about the factions that I've seemingly forgotten. Haven't forgotten them at all. They're very important to the story of the human sphere. But again, this is very tailored to someone who's coming into Infinity new. And instead of getting bogged down into all of the factions that exist, we'll limit this at the moment to just the factions that relate to Code 1. There will be further expansions on this as N4 enables rules for other armies, or if they release faction rules, for different factions for Code 1, then I'll do a special that updates their place within the human sphere. But otherwise, that's the basics. If you're getting into Infinity for the first time, I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of the history, the lore, the world that you are playing in. It is a fantastic game. You have done an exceptional job finding it and to get on board. It's hugely enjoyable, unlike anything else I've ever played. And the history just keeps getting richer and the story's more vibrant and the factions uh, even more enjoyable to play against and learn more about. There's huge variety available, uh, something for everyone. It's highly enjoyable, and Corpus Belli are doing a great job of releasing more miniatures, uh, more profiles as the months progress. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me ramble on about the history and the lore of the human sphere. I hope you've enjoyed it. Pop into the comments any favorite bits that you had or any questions that you've got that I can maybe expand upon. As always, you can follow me on Instagram if you'd like to see some behind the scenes shots of terrain, uh, models being painted, just behind the scenes things, in-game shots. And please subscribe to the channel if you've liked the content so far as I try and put out a weekly video of some description. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video and I'll catch you soon.